Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study on Judges 15. We have a few things that we have to tie up from last time. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the studies we have each morning. And we invite your presence as we open your word together. May your Holy Spirit instruct us. May you give us clear minds, a clear understanding. May you correct us of all errors. And we pray, Lord, for a unity with Christ and with one another. And we pray for this movement. You know all the things that are in our hearts, and you know the things that need to be reformed. We ask, Lord, that you can come into our hearts, into our lives, and that you can change the things that need to be changed. Help us to cooperate with your work. Be with us now as we study together, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So yesterday we spent a lot of time on the 300 going over all of the different examples of 300 and I was really trying to get down to the question of how we understand uh, this symbol. Now, we know, of course, these are three in the story of Samson. It's 300 foxes. And uh, Stephen drew out a diagram, which we're going to look at. So one of the things that we did is we tied this uh, uh, when Samson takes the 300 foxes and turn tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between the two tails, we notice the similarity of uh, the two, ta two tails of these firebrands, uh, referring to um, uh, the kings there in Isaiah chapter 7. So Stephen put together this diagram that ties some of the other uh, things that we talked about, the 300 years, after Methuselah was born, etc. So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> so the two tales of these smoking firebrands, that's Isaiah 7, verse 4. And um, so that's referring to uh, Remaliah. What is, um, who is it referring to specifically? Um, Not Rezin and Pekka. Yeah, yeah. So Reza and Pekka. So the son of Remaliah, which is Pekka, and Rezin, the king of Syria. So that's who it's referring to. Just making sure. And uh, so we can see that there is this uh, tales, the idea of tales and firebrands. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, Another, why why does he refer to them that way? Then, what is the what is that? Because we you know I never really thought about that before when I've read that passage. The two tales of these smoking firebrands. Just it's just to me it was just kind of colorful language. But is it is it a reference to Judges fifteen verse four? If you're going to do it line upon line, I think mm. you'd have to connect to there because they were going to bring desolation was what they're going to do anyway. They're going to take over. And that's what uh, these foxes did. They burned the, the corn, the vineyards, mm. the olives. Yeah, so but definitely line upon line we would. But I wonder if even if Isaiah is referring to that. taking that story as an example. You know, I mean, I don't know of any other example of it. Um, but, you know, it must have meant something to them um, for him to say that. So the idea of destruction being let loose by... Uh, 
and of course tails. I mean, it doesn't say specifically foxes in Isaiah seven, but um, you know, it, it would be something that you know they would have to have a reference to, and I think it would be Judges fifteen verse four. Now, in Isaiah 7, verse 16, it talks about the land shall be forsaken of both her kings. That's going to be um, first technically 19 years after the giving of the prophecy. Um, Hoshea is going to be uh, taken captive. And then, you know, once uh, Samaria is destroyed, that's going to mark that 19 year period. And then you're going to have 46 years remaining until Manasseh's captivity. Um, now, the 300 years land divided two kings, what do you mean by that? Well, that's the, the dividing of the kingdom. Yeah, so you're going so, back. So it mentions, yeah, so it mentions there in Isaiah 7, verse 16, both are kings, so that's two kings. So that right. there, and then two kings really developed 300 right. years prior right so yeah so it's i mean we probably could put that 977 in there for people to to see that but from 970 or 977 to 677 is 300 years so so you have 300 years um with that 65 years um overlapping at the end of it Right. And then you have 300 more years. Um, well, we don't really, but, but you understand what I'm saying? We have this, these symbols of the foxes. So in obviously here, you're not going to have the 300 years from uh, 677 onward. Right. But, but we have that symbol there and that's going to actually be the 22520s. Right. That's how we would look at that. Or the two twelve sixties, I mean. Well, the two twenty five twenties and the two twelve sixties. So it's it's all part of a structure. I mean, it's not, you know, they're not going to start in six seventy seven the two twelve sixties, but at least it it symbolizes that. Is that how we would look at it? Yeah. Well, you have seven twenty three. The two twelve sixties, mm -hmm. and then so we just yeah, don't, yeah. you know, directly. But okay, so somebody looking at this, unless they knew a bit more, they might have a bit, a bit of confusion, confusion regarding it. Right. I mean, now of course you're taking the the two one fifties and you're laying them down there below, um, and you're taking Enoch. So we know there's the sixty five years from when Enoch is born to Methuselah being born, and then Enoch lives another 300 years. So you're taking those foxes and laying them down over top of that. Yeah, it's so kind you, of creating a midpoint. Right. So you get this midpoint part of it, and which, which we didn't really have in that story of Enoch. We never looked at a midpoint. But now we can see that the 65 years and the 150 years, that would be the midpoint. Together, are 215 years. And that's 215 years is a part of this structure of the 430 years. So, so what we see happening here is this is a different way, at least the way I understand it, a different way of seeing the relationships between these different chiasms that in a sense they interlock, that they give information about each one. These are wheels within wheels. Does that make sense to people, what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, because even though, you know, we've had all these different chiasm, chiasms with different lengths of time, um, we haven't really seen how they lock together. Uh, I mean, a little bit here and there, but we can see quite clearly we can take, you know, the story of Enoch and Methuselah that, of course, is going to begin the 777 years. Uh, like it's going to be connected to the 777 years of um, 
Lamech, which we don't have in here. But um, we can now find this midpoint in this 300 years. And that midpoint, uh, we can then take that 65 years at the beginning and see it's a period of 215 years. And so we would say then that 430 years that has these two periods of 215 years is related to this chiasm that we created using Enoch and Methuselah. And that comes, of course, from the beginning of the structure of the 2520, right? The 65 years that gives us that um, symbol there, right? Now, we know that we don't divide the, the 2520 for Judah into two periods of 1260. Um, now, there was some way in which we looked at the, because what's the center year of the 225 or of the 2520 for Judah? Um, the there was some way in which we addressed the center point of that, but I can't remember what it is. Do you remember, Stephen? Yeah, I'm doing the math here first. Yeah. <laughs> So 584. Yeah, but there was there was something that we had done about that. It wasn't so much uh, the the year. It was something to do with, with some date, but I don't remember what it was. Um, I can't remember who did it, but I, I thought it was interesting at the time. I thought it might have been you, but... Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, there's, so for the most part, anyway, we don't address the center of the 2520 for Judah, just the one for Israel. But we can see the how that symbol there is connected with the firebrands. It connects us to the structure of the 300 foxes. And the 300 foxes, you can then see that it's, two groups of 150 foxes. Um, you know, and another thing, when we look at the chiasm of the animals that are sacrificed in Genesis 15, um, you know, they're three years of age, right? So if you take an animal that's three years in age and cut it in half, each half is how old? No, it yeah, doesn't. three. <laughs> 1.5. I, I know it doesn't quite work that way, but but you understand what I'm saying as a symbol. So, so you can see the 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 three years can symbolize the the 300. Yeah, I sort of connected the uh, three years just to the week of Christ. You know, you got an animal in half. You got the half there. And then you get mm. to three years, so you get two, three and a half. Yeah, I know. I, I, yeah, I understand. That's how we've always kind of done it. We've looked at it that way. But I'm just saying as far as this symbol here with the 300, um, we can see that there's that similarity. That there, there is this overlap between the 300 and the 150. There's this relationship. Because we do have those two periods of 300 years as well. And then we have um, uh, the story of Joseph in here, of course, with the 215 years and that midpoint. And then, of course, we connect that midpoint in the story of Joseph to the midpoint in, in uh, Millerite history. And we get that 93 years and 93 days being lined up. So that has to do with when Adam dies he dies aged 193 now it's a little bit so that 93 years up there is between the midpoint of this 300 years and when adam dies correct 
I'm reading that correctly. Yeah, well, I'm just saying 93 years going back ties in with the 93 days. Yeah. So from when Adam dies, if you go 93 years back, it goes to the midpoint. That's what you're saying. Right, okay. Well, yes. If, uh, um, not that there's 93 years the other side of that there, you know. You wouldn't go no. 93 years. But it yeah. just sort of takes just 93 years going back, takes you to the midpoint, which has, sort of typifies the 93 days going back to the midpoint. And yeah, so, right so, so Adam dies long before that, you're saying? Um, no, Adam dies after the midpoint, 93 okay. years. After. Okay, so that's what you're saying. Okay, so Adam dies 93 years after the midpoint. So that, I was reading that correctly then. Now, Adam dies at the age of 930. So that relates to the 93. And then, of course, the 93 years symbolize the 93 days. Now, um, aside from, um, I mean, we don't know how many other people died before Adam, but because, um, you know, we know that uh, Abel died. Adam died but I mean from from the perspective of Adam dying if we look at the symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month that's that's a close of probation for Adam yes All right so it's the close of probation for the first man that was created and it can line up in this structure so this is a rather complex structure I mean, it's it's tying together different lines that gives us these different symbols. Um, so so it, it's it's pretty powerful, but it would you know it's it's not the simplest thing to to understand. But I mean, uh, you know, we can understand it because we've gone through these things. But just showing this to somebody offhand might not be the easiest thing. But if you prepare them for it, you, if you Present each of these lines first, um, then you know this. This would make sense to people, but it, it, I, I think it's quite a powerful diagram. I think what it what it brings together is, and 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 there could be more added to it, but for now, that's because you know we could put the two twelve sixties in there somehow and, and other things, but we'd end up with a much more complex picture. But it shows us how these lines are tied together. Now, I don't, you know, when we, there still is this question that I want to resolve regarding Judges 15. So anybody else, any comments on this uh, diagram before we move away from it? Uh, really, you know, I'm really thankful for all, for all this. I actually managed to copy it and I'll certainly look at it. But one verse that comes to me is Proverbs 26, 18, about the gossip, the slander, as how the man that casts firebrands, arrows, and death. I mm -hmm. wonder if that fit in there. Well, it definitely would fit. Um, I mean, because one of the things that we've been addressing has been slander and gossip. Yes, I know. And it's one of the things that... that that has damaged the movement. Which and one is that, Angela? Oh, it's Proverbs uh, 26, 18, and 19. I'll read it to you. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, I'm not I in sport. It's like saying, just kidding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's something, and we've talked about this before, that it affected a movement long, long before. I mean, reports about people and, and listening to these reports and having it affect um, basically whether we listened to them or not, whether we examined what they had to say or not. So instead of examining things according to God's word, it was just rumors and gossip, gossip about people that we could then discount anything they're doing or saying. 
brought up three of them. Yeah. Is is that sixty five? Is it sixty five years? Is it part of the three hundred, or is it separate from the three hundred? You mean from Enoch being born? Yeah. That's separate. So, so Enoch lives for three hundred and sixty five years. Right. Right. Okay. So, so remember, you know, Enoch's born. 65 years later, Methuselah is born, and then you're going to have okay. 187 years later, uh, Lamech's going to be born. So you're going to have 65 plus 187, that's 252. And that's what we had looked at before, but we never thought of dividing the 300 into two periods of 150 to find the midpoint and to see what it would be. Well, that's 65. Could it go along with um, Isaiah 7? Yeah, that's what we have there. Okay. Isaiah 7, that's 65 years. Um, okay. That definitely relates to the 65 years from Enoch to Methuselah's birth. Right. And Methuselah is going to die in the year that the flood occurs, right? Is it the year that the flood occurs? Or is it five years before? No. Uh, Methuselah uh, dies the year of the flood. The year of the flood. Where's the five-year thing? Some five-year thing in there. Yeah, L Lamech dies five years before. Ah, Lamech dies. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so Methuselah dies in the year of the flood. And then, yeah, Lamech dies five years before. And we looked at that before. Um, so I just remembered there was a five years in there. Mm -hmm. Which we could see as 1,800 prophetic days. Right. So I'm trying to remember. I can't remember everything, but yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was the 1800 prophetic days. Okay. Um, just a, a thought concerning the foxes here, the, the 300. Yeah. Uh, also around that time, we know there was um, 300 year prophecies. There was Jephthah. And then the... Uh, Tabernacle being set up in Shiloh. Yeah. So to me, you're sort of seeing them firebrands connected to uh, time in Isaiah 7 4. Mm -hmm. And you have 300 years connected to them in the sense at the end of that, 65 years. Um, and so I'm just thinking these. To me, it's more of an element connecting 300 years to something around the time of where we are in Judges 15 for. I'm not too sure which 300 year period we could connect it to. I would tend to think maybe more the uh, the shadow one, maybe, but uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, to me, okay, just hints of that anyway. Yeah, so the idea here that you that you introduce is that this 65 years that I, Isaiah presents, he's actually predicting the end of a 300 year period. Yes. Right. That is whether he willing, you know, whether he fully understands what he's doing or not. Um, and it's this the smoking firebrands in these two tails, right? That's going to bring us back to this 300 foxes and he's going to be making a prediction um, that the land will be forsaken of both her kings and since this is the dividing of the kingdom that's 300 years previous i mean this is indirectly a prediction regarding the end of a 300 year period mm -hmm. Yeah, which is which is pretty profound, right? So, you know, we always just thought he's predicting the beginning of the two twenty five twenties, but really he's reaching back to that dividing of the kingdom and prophesying basically the end of a divided kingdom. I mean, not directly, right? Because the kingdom is, in a sense, nineteen years later, you're going to have the captivity of Hoshea. Um, but, well, actually, technically 17 years later, but, you know, the destruction of Samaria. So Samaria no longer has a capital. It's destroyed. 
or northern Israel no longer has a capital. Samaria is destroyed. But then there's still going to be 46 years to um, Manasseh being captive. And Manasseh's captivity is going to mark a progressive destruction of four that's going to lead ultimately to the destruction of, of Judah, right? So these things are all tied together. I mean, this is a tapestry of prophecy that's being woven uh, that begins right in the beginning of Genesis. All of these, because even though we think about the first time prophecy technically being the 120 years of Noah, which it's the first one that's really proclaimed, even these ages that these patriarchs live and when they have their children, the age they are when they when their son is born, the next in the line of carrying that promised seed, these are also prophecies. Right? These these become part of the structure of prophetic um uh, you know, these prophetic periods, right? I mean, that's what we see happening here. You know, so these very basic things, we don't have it on this chart here, but the 65 years, the 187 years, making 252 years, and then the 777 years and for Lamech, and then the five years at the end, um, those all become... Very powerful. Where's the, 70, where's the 77 at again? So, um, 77 so Methuselah, years. Old. When Methuselah is 187 years old, um, he's going to give birth to Lamech. Well, he won't, his wife will, but right? So, yeah. 65 years and then 187 years. And then 777 years. Right? And, then, yeah. and then five years, and then you have the flood. So um, and the what and the 65 and 187 add up to 252. So that becomes um, an important symbol as well. And even in this 252 years, or 250, 215 years. Remember that part of that structure dealing with um, them entering the land of Israel or the or entering into Egypt and then leaving Egypt and going into that land of Israel, that span of 215 years. There's still going to be this period of time. So we 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 go to actually to the to Jacob's death and then to the 40 years plus the 14 years that's going to make the 54 years. And you add that on to um, the 215 plus 54. Uh, let me see. It's going to minus 12. I think it is. So you end up with 252. And this becomes this chain of 252 years. And, and in that chain, you're going to have... Um, I guess it's from when Jacob blesses his 12 sons um, to, um, to 725 BC. That's going to be three periods of 252. Is that, or is it going to be four periods of 252? Right? Yeah, four, I think. Yeah, four periods of 252 years, and then three periods of 252 years to 34 AD, right? So the, um, or pardon me, let me think here, three periods to, um, yeah, to 34 AD. And then you're going to have the seven periods of 252 to 1798. So this this was part of the structure of 252, but it, it really goes, it really now connects to um, the story of Joseph, as we can see. So so we can take the story of Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech, and we can take the story of Abraham leaving a Haran with Joseph and Jacob um, being reunited at this midpoint, and all of this diff, these different structures, they're all interlocked with each other. 
right? So they're all connected. So the structure of prof prophetic chronology, you know, that paper that I wrote, there's still more to be added to that, uh, that we have seen and how these things are connected. So. Now, um, going back to Judges chapter 15. So the, so the question that I had asked regarding this 300 is, what is this symbol of 300? And what was the conclusion we came about 300 just on its own? What does it symbolize? What did we conclude? 300 symbolizes what? Well, I remember the 144th days that was mentioned. Okay. And, and that was because of the connection to the story of Gideon, primarily. Yes, and you can connect it to Enoch as well, in the sense that he's kind of taken up like the 144,000 typical Okay. So from the time that he um, has Methuselah until he is translated. Okay. Now, can we connect it to a resurrection, not just a translation? 300. Would it be Moses? Yeah. So, so can we connect it to Moses in any way? Elijah. Elijah. Okay. Elijah okay. connected with Elijah. To... Okay. Well, so that's what I'm asking. I mean, is there any connection there with the 300 with Moses or Elijah? We have it connected to Enoch. Might be a bit obscure, but we know uh, Moses lived 120 years, and then you have 120 years to the ark okay. being built in the time of Noah, and that was 300 cubits. So, <laughs> maybe a bit of a okay. Well, yeah, we're just obscure connection. Yeah. Well, okay. So what we can do is we can say there's 120 years of United Israel and 300 years of divided Israel to the captivity of Manasseh, the beginning of the six, four, seven times for Judah. So we can connect 300 and 120, right? That would be another witness. Yeah. Now, so so we can connect it in some ways to a symbol to the hundred of the hundred and forty four thousand. But um, I mean, in some ways, it's it's a symbol of a victory, right? So the hundred and forty four thousand. I mean, they are victorious over the beast and his image. So, so I still think there's probably something more we don't see about this number 300, even though we've looked at every possible 300 that we could. It definitely is a prophetic symbol. And it can, can be divided into to 150 and 150.
I'm looking at the living word in 3D.com that mentions the sheen there and a whole bunch of other stuff because I, I just typed in uh, 300 in in the Bible and it, and I got this. So if anybody wants to look at it, I don't know how valid all of it is, but it's interesting. Yeah. Where, where it looks at all the different 300s? Right. Yeah, Living Word in 3D.com. Yeah, I figured you must have looked at that before. Yeah, I looked at it. Right. So that's they, they list all the different 300s. There's other ones that do that as well. Um, so, yeah, so there's all these different 300s that we have. Um, so we looked at them, as far as I know, every 300 I could think of. Um, so Aran's asking about Pentecost to the first day of the first month. Yeah, so, well, you have 3,000 3, there. And then you go and you have like 120 in the upper room. And then yeah. 3,000, so maybe just an extra zero on top of the 300. Okay. Also, if you multiply 120 by 300, it takes, gives you 36,000. Uh, if you're con connecting up from Saul to Manasseh's captivity, then beginning of four generations, and multiply that again before, you have the number four there beginning, it takes you to 144,000. Okay, so that calculation just bring us through it again? Yeah, so 120 times 300 yeah. times four. Gives us 144,000. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the 65 balances with the 300. Um, can you explain that, what you mean? Or maybe I'm not reading all, all of the. It's just, uh, you know, 65 and 300. You have 365 days in a year. So yeah. in that sense, it's a could be seen as a division midpoint. Yeah, and especially how we think of the number 365. I mean, now we just think it's, well, 365, right? But originally it'd be 300, you know, three score and five, right? Um, or something to that effect, 300 and then 65. So we just write it all as one number, but they would have written it out as 300 by itself and then 65. So you can see the 65 and 300 kind of go together. Yeah. I know it's it's a lot of, lot of detail here dealing with this, but my main concern about this um, in trying to understand this goes to this diagram. Because we take the first day of the first month, or first day of the 10th month, and we go to the first day of the first month, and we have this uh, period of time, which is represented by a dashed line, just because it's tying two different dates to April 5th, 2030, January 11th, 2023, and December 25th, 2022, which both symbolize the first day of the 10th month. One, because it is the first day of the 10th month on the biblical calendar. And the other one, because of its connection to the story of, of Ezra and uh, the counting of the 88 days, right? So period of 2,640 days based upon 88 days being 88 prophetic months. So um, it's, it's also interesting uh, from Stephen's chart there where he had the 721, um, so, well, July, July 21, 721. And if you take 721 weeks, you're actually just one week short of that, that, uh, 
2640. So 721 weeks. Pardon me, not, not 721 weeks, but seven. What am I doing here? It's actually 7.21 years. That's what it is. So if I take 7.21 years and multiply it by 365.25, I am one week one week shy of 2640. So I'll show you this calculation. I'll do it again. So just so if I take July 21st and I multiply it by 365.25. So that's the number of days in a year. I get this 2633 and, and a decimal. Uh, which is almost a half a day. But from the period of time when we go from, uh, I guess it's going to be, uh, well, what's the date? So it's going to be Wednesday, right? So if we count from the end of Wednesday to April 5th, 2030, we're going to, we're going to have 2,640 days, but this is, this is just uh, six, and a half days short of that. Is is that significant at all? Or is this just an anomaly? Certainly worth uh, pegging up, you know, looking at it. And Now you can see it's 10 hours and 86, 8.86 8 uh, hours, so 10 and 0.86 hours. You can see the symbol for 187 there, 186 days. Cardinal count from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, if I just put that into minutes, it's going to be 51 minutes and 0.6 seconds. I don't know. I'm just, I, I just think there is something about this period of time that I'm trying to understand. That's mainly what I'm looking at. So when I look at this period of time here, that's been given us as a symbol, it, it's going to start with these 300 foxes. Now, these 300 foxes, of course, this is going to be because on Pentecost, Samson is, is and we're saying that these messages, Collins and Odilios, uh, represent, the, represent the two loaves that are offered on Pentecost. And he's going to go down to you know, bring the Pentecost offering, the kid of the goats, to his wife. And, you know, he's going to be rebuffed, so to speak, right, by the father. And then uh, in response to that, he's going to take these 300 foxes, tie them tail to tail. And I'm saying that that represents uh, that process in the story of Ezra. Right, so this is dealing with the, the false message, right? So we're not going to take this and flip it on its head. The story of the foxes, the symbol of the foxes is a false prophet. And this is a counterfeit message addressing the Sunday law because we dealt with the 300 and um, all of the different symbols that would connect us with this. We talked about the township roads um, and how that relates So now, if we're going to look at this period of time, what is this representing? I mean, we, we have all these symbols, but it seems like we're not really ready to, to address this period of time. And, and it could be just that we don't have enough information yet.
Okay, so Pentecost is the 65th day plus 300 foxes. Okay, can you explain that? 65 plus 300. It's just another three, I mean, it's another 365 because you have the 65 there plus the 300. Um, where? At the wheat harvest? Is it, you oh. said the wheat harvest was Pentecost. Yeah, but where's the 65? Just the, the fact that it's that's how long it is till the wheat harvest. Oh, uh, I see from the not... from the from the first day of the first month to oh, the wheat harvest. You, okay, so if you count from the first day of the first month, you're taking. 49 days plus 16 days, which is 65 days, right? 49 plus 16 is 65. Okay, I, I didn't understand that. So, so what you're saying is if you count from the first day of the first month to Pentecost, it's going to be 65 days. Yeah, and I think it's to the end of Pentecost, like not that morning, but to the end of. Well, yeah, well, I don't know what you to the to the end of Pentecost. If you can, saying, from from the first from the start of the year to the end of Pentecost, like sixty five yeah, days, inclusive. Yep. Yeah, yeah, because what you have is you have um, uh, if you want to count count it one way, is you can say there's the six days at, at the Pentecost is the sixth day of the third month, so that's six days. And then you have, if you're doing a cardinal count, well, let me think here. So you're going from, yeah, because you have 59 days plus six days, so that's 65, right? So that's an inclusive count. Yeah, so that that's fine. And then we have 300 foxes. So, so that's that's pretty interesting. Does that? I mean, I mean, it it confirms what we already understand here. We have the 65 and the 300. So, what is the 300 then? Is it just? I mean, if we were going to, let's say, we're going to take the 300 and we're going to connect it to Enoch, right? You're, you're going to have 65 years, Enoch has Methuselah. Now, what does Methuselah represent? July 18, maybe. Okay, well, just in the story, when he dies, it will come, right? Prophecy? Yeah, so it's, it's a prophecy, right? So it's a prophecy... That's going to be fulfilled. Now, the later on, you know, you're going to have uh, Methuselah is going to have Lamech. Lamech is going to have Noah. Noah is going to be the one who receives this 120 year prophecy. So it's going to be narrowed down as we move through. So this becomes a progressive message. Right. Regarding the end. Now, so this 300 years, you know, or this 300 here, this symbol of the foxes, it's preceded by 65 and then 300, right? So um, so 300 is going to give us this message of, it's, it's going to bring us to, well, we say the 144,000, right? So it's, it's going to tie us to that. It's going to tie us to the story, story of Gideon. So it does tie us to July 18th, right? Plus we know that uh, uh, that when Methuselah is 187, he's going to give birth to Lamech, the, the 777, right? So we can see how these are all tied together. Does that still help us to understand what this April 5th, 2030 is?
or or should, is this something that we just need to just accept as a symbol for now and leave it aside? Or do we need to examine it further in the context of what we're going to read in Judges 15 and 16? Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to go to Judges 15. So after he sends these foxes, it says, Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he hath taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. So we know that there's this judgment upon uh, Samson's wife and her father. So have we decided what this means? Is this a judgment upon something, someone? Does it address a message? I think, yes, it does address a message. Okay. So what message? What if this is the message that's been accepted within the church and the movement that Parminder and Tess had been presenting? Okay. Well, I would think this would have to be uh, the next thing that happens. Now, um, so, so we know that this, this, Wife that Samson's going to, in a sense, I mean, he doesn't really put her away, but this is a type of divorce. It's done by the father, right? The father and the mother, I guess, to some extent. They're going to say, well, you know, you didn't, you seem to hate her. So, so we gave, you know, gave her to your companion, the one that used to be your companion. So, How do we relate this then to this burning of her and her father? And I, and I agree with Dwight that this would have to do with this message in the church and that was in the movement and still to some degree is in the movement, the, this message of Parminder. But why is it burnt with fire? And why her and her father? Not trying to avoid your question, but what if this is the rejection of the false righteousness by faith? Okay, explain a bit more. Well, as we have studied on, on Friday evenings and as we have had other conversations, the righteous, the, the true message of righteousness by faith has never been accepted within the church. Or the movement. Or the movement, agreed. I was using the church as a as a whole and including the movement with that. So at this point, it's been more in line with what apostate protestantism has had to say rather than what scriptures had to say so in this situation 
if the quote divorce unquote is indeed a message and i would have to think that it is then if we apply this in this manner that this is the um false message of righteousness by faith that needs to be set aside so that the true message of righteousness by faith can be fully understood yeah well i mean so i mean what we're trying to do in the friday night studies is present righteousness by faith right now, one of the most difficult things to present to a seventh-day adventist and that's because whether you're you know, if you're a conservative Adventist, you believe that you understand righteousness by faith, yet you don't because you you believe it in a in in an opposition to something else. That is, it it becomes this dialectical environment. You've stepped on the ground of Satan in order to uh, build your belief. That if you you've adopted some of the premises of of the enemy right you've stepped on the enemy's ground would, would people agree with me in that analogy regarding how most and i would say almost everybody in adventism who is who claims to be a champion of righteousness by faith has actually stepped on the ground of the enemy and do in so doing People know what I'm talking about. What specific point am I addressing here in talking about the ground? What is the ground? What is the premise? There's maybe a few, but the primary one. That we need to do nothing else except Christ is our Savior. Okay, well, that, that's sort of the symptom of the premise. That becomes the, the conclusion. Right. So the question is, what is the basic premise that has been offered um, in this discussion that everybody sort of misses? That is, they don't break it down to the basic assumptions that are being made. They argue on the ground of the enemy. So what is that ground? that we are arguing on what is the what is the idea it wouldn't be the way we educate it all is it well education? well i mean that's that's much more basic i mean because you know it's a dialectical argument but but i would i would take it something like if you look at romans 7 you'll see that there is this this argument is this a converted paul or an unconverted paul and if you take the position it's it's an unconverted paul you're just talking about what paul's talking about his nature was before he was converted right that's the basic idea you know paul couldn't possibly as, as a converted person being saying that about himself right that and that that's usually the per, the position that's taken by conservatives and then you have uh the people who say well no this is paul as he's converted right that that's always going to be our experience we're always going to be sinning and repenting sinning and repenting right those those are the two basic um views and in, in a dialectical argument, there's two sides, right? There's one or the other. You're given a um, a true-false uh, questionnaire. But are both wrong? And if they're both wrong, what's the premise that shows that they're both wrong? Because this, this showed up in 1887 in the two books 
on Galatians. So that's Butler's book and E.J. Wagner's book in response, which we're going to 1887 look at. or 1886? Um, 1887. The books are written in 1887. Okay. So in 1887, you have these books, two books on Galatians, Butler's book, and Wagner's response. So prior to 1888, it's my understanding. Um, so, so in the book, what you have is Butler saying, well, Jesus couldn't have had a sinful human nature his whole lifetime. He couldn't have been, well, he doesn't say it that way, what he says is that he couldn't have been under the law his entire life, under the condemnation of the law, because Wagner's arguing that to be under the law means to be under its condemnation, not just under obligation to keep it. So Butler says he couldn't have been under the condemnation of the law his whole lifetime, because he's holy, undefiled, and separate from sinners. But he'll admit that he did bear our sins upon the cross. At that point, he was under the condemnation of the law. So Wagner says, well, if he could be under the condemnation of the law at one point of his life without being a sinner, this means that he could be under the condemnation of the law his whole life without being a sinner. And, and what Wagner and Jones argue is that Christ, by being made a man, was made under the law. He was born under the law. Right? By taking upon himself human nature, he's under the condemnation of the law. And it's re you're re going to be really hard-pressed to find conservative Adventists who will agree with that idea. Right? When we look at the nature of Christ argument that was raging in the eight, uh, 1980s and 1990s in Adventism, um, it eventually got resolved by redefining words, but um, we're going to look at that in more detail uh, in our Friday night studies. But what, what conservatives would say that the nature of Christ was is just he had the possibility of sinning and he had um, this sort of part in his nature that was, uh, you know, tempting him all the time. So he had a sinful human nature. But they don't have the idea that he's under the condemnation of the law, right? Because there's this idea of original sin, right? So they argue against the idea that there is such a thing as original sin. No, I call it original guilt. Because Christ felt guilty his whole lifetime. This Jones clearly shows that it wasn't just something that happened when he entered in the Garden of Gethsemane. He, he feels he's, he stands in the place of the 144,000. The 144,000 have no memory of sins. Christ had no memory of any sins he actually committed because he didn't commit any. The 144,000 have their sins blotted out. They have no memory of any sins that they committed because those have been blotted out. And yet they can see in their lives no good things. So see, being the, the operative word there, Christ could not see himself as righteous. He didn't know he was righteous by sight. He only knew it based upon God's word. When he looked at himself, his nature, he saw the same thing that Paul saw when Paul looked at his nature. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, Parminder uh, played into this whole thing and, and lied to Jeff about what he was teaching. Because I think Jeff actually does understand the nature of Christ um, in the correct way. Um, but, but you can see the problem is that people believe that when they see themselves as righteous, you know, they see themselves as victorious, they see themselves as good, then that, that means God's working in their lives. But who sees themselves as righteous and who sees themselves as good? That would be the Laodicean church. 
right? So you don't see this idea taught very often at all, that the closer you cr come to Christ, the more sinful you appear in your own eyes. Sometimes it's, it's mentioned because it's there in the spirit of prophecy, but it's not understood because people do see themselves as righteous. We see ourselves as good. The only way we won't is if we behold Christ. It's impossible to behold Christ and see yourself as good. 144,000 don't see themselves as good because they're beholding Christ. They're comparing themselves to Christ. That's like, this is a bad example, but it's like somebody who comes into the guitar store who can't really play guitar very well. And, and they try to play guitar and, you know, they think they're really good. And then you have somebody who's like an absolute master on guitar and he plays something for you and apologizes because it's not very good. Right. So we can see when we have this higher standard that we're comparing ourselves to, we're not going to consider ourselves as accomplished. And so we need to see Christ. That's what righteousness by faith is about. That's what, that's why we need this looking glass vision. That's why we need a revelation of Christ. Um, so you can see in this movement these ideas about um, righteousness. And, and, and these things aren't wrong. I mean, little sins are a big issue. But people think that they can be made righteous by not eating between meals. But somehow if you can, you can take care of these, these things that we can easily control... I mean, maybe not for everyone, but some people can easily control, you know, what they eat and when they eat. And then they can think they're righteous and they can hold this up as the standard of righteous or what righteousness or whatever it is that you naturally can do that makes you feel that you're better than other people. You can hold that up as the standard of what needs to be done in order to become righteous, because you're not going to say you're righteous because you're, you know, you know, you can't say that. But you're going to believe that you're righteous because you can do, you can reach the standard that you have set for yourself that isn't the standard of Christ's character. So we can be ignoring the weightier matters of the law. We can talk nice to people's faces and we can say all the right things, but we are far from God. Because if we're going to believe what God says about us, we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Do we believe him? And if we say we're well, not, I do about myself. Yeah. And, and anyone who really comes to Christ has to see this. If you come to Christ, you're going to see this. But we can keep Christ far off. We can, in our own imaginations, justify. We can talk about other people and compare ourselves with others. And, of course, we can easily convince ourselves that we're more righteous than some other person who's definitely not righteous. Right? In our, in our minds. The Pharisee can compare himself with the publican and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not like this publican. But if that publican recognizes his sin, if he sees Christ, he goes down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. And this is righteousness by faith. But we make righteousness by faith into righteousness by works. Something that we, we can see, that we can, some goal that we can achieve. If I can just do this or I can just do that. And we don't have the freedom of trusting in Christ that he is working in us and cooperating with him, which means a cross, an everyday trial. Christ had a trial every day. As a child, every day was a trial. 
He didn't live a happy-go-lucky childhood because he was burdened by the weight of sin because he had a sinful nature and yet he was God. Any who are following God are going to be burdened in a certain sense with the weight of their sin, but they're not going to just bear it themselves. They're going to yoke up with Christ, cooperate with him. Otherwise, those sins would just crush us. And if we, you know, if we could recognize this, because this is the struggle that Jones had, A.T. Jones, is he could preach a message of righteousness by faith, but it never got very far. So what's going to be the difference now? What's going to make the difference in this movement? You know, what's going to make, what's going to allow people not to be annoyed by me because I'm, you know, so complex in my thinking that they're going to actually listen to what I'm saying. I mean, maybe, maybe something else has to happen, but you know, if I'm going to be like Jones, remember what A.T. Jones said, or Alan White said about A.T. Jones. He was offering this wonderful fruit to people, but in the manner in which he was offering it, it was repulsive. Right? That's not, you know, that's a paraphrase of what she's saying. It's not word for word, but basically he, he made it unattractive because of his character. What's that, Jeff? I was going to say everybody needs, we all need to look at ourselves, you know, point at ourselves before... Our, our, look at our characters before we can judge somebody else. I know. So so here's my problem that, that I've faced my whole life, and I'm sure a lot of you have, can feel the same way. When there's something that you have that you know to be true, you know, especially when like you first became an Adventist, and you want to share it with people, you know, people aren't responsive. Like you would love like to be able to share some this precious truth and yet you know they're not they're not responsive and part of it is because of your character right i mean at least that's what i think i mean i i think the big problem that i often have is i don't reflect christ people can look at especially people who know me they can know all my defects they can see uh, you know they can just dismiss what i'm saying you know, my children can do that. They know my faults. Right? They can look back at my past and say, well, you know, dad's just kind of a religious fanatic or something, right? So we're not really going to examine what he's saying. And, and we have this, this problem all the time. So if we're, we're going to share truth with somebody, it, it, that person has to desire to know the truth. And yet we can be a hindrance to that, right? So that's why we pray every day, Lord, you know, help me to reflect your character in, in all my contacts with others. You know, help me to be obedient to your word. Help me to, uh, to recognize what to say in a situation, what words to use uh, so that your, your truth can reach the heart and that I won't be an impediment to that, that I will be an aid. And yet we seem to fail in that. You know, even Christ felt like a failure in that respect. You know, our Redeemer was constantly confronted with apparent failure. The messenger mercy of mercy, um, it, what he saw, I, I can't remember the exact words. He, it's it, it, The messenger of mercy to this world saw... Um, that he had done little in in reaching and saving others he felt that he could have done more he felt that his work was insufficient but you know he, he trusted in his father in spite of how he felt in spite of what he saw he trusted in god and he knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his a series of uninterrupted victories not seen to be such here at, but recognized 
as such in the great hereafter. So when we look at our lives, we're going to see our lives much different than we see them now. So we don't need to see our lives as constantly uh, being victorious. We just need to trust that, that God is doing these things in us. So the question then, um, so getting back to what we're looking at here. So if this, as Dwight is saying, burnt her and her father with fire, would this fire be the fire of the Holy Spirit? And if it's the Philistines, why the Philistines? Do we have to take that part and flip it on its head morally? How would you do that? Well, we in the literal story, so Philistines are not a symbol, right? I mean, right. but we're just taking in on the literal story. So, but we know that fire is a symbol. So the Philistines in this story, in, in, in just the literal story, I mean, we have to flip that around. Well, as I had been looking at this and to consider this, I had been looking at the Philistines because it was so very clear that Samson was not to enter into agreement, league, or however you want to say that, with the Philistines, yeah. that this could easily represent apostate Protestantism. Okay. But, which I understand what you're saying, but we know that we're taking this story and, and we're turning it morally on its head, which sometimes is difficult because okay. we have the same. So what I'm saying is that we always take the symbols themselves at their face value, what they represent. But the literal story, we don't. The literal story, we have to flip on its head. So the Philistines in, in the literal story are doing something bad, but in, in, with the symbols here, um, this would have to be something good. The fire here would have to represent the fire of the Holy Spirit. The fire can have two different symbols. It can be destructive, but it also does represent the Holy Spirit. But the one that's being burnt, her and her father, are a message that comes from the church. And the father here, so, you know, there's different ways that we've looked at it. But if we go back to the to the part where the father is going to say, offer the daughter, that daughter is going to be the Omega. And in some ways, we could say that that this represents FFA. Because it's, it's really through FFA that Omega is being offered. It's kind of an amazing thought. Yeah. But they're going to be destroyed. And, and so that message, that false message, the part of the message, because, you know, this is a correction line, right? That was, you know, part of what I was, was uh, talking about with this, that this is something where... Um, this movement had been going in a wrong direction. And the reason why it was going in a wrong direction, I mean, we could look at the external problems or the internal problems or whatever you want to call them. But, but the root of that had to do with um, this lack of understanding of righteousness by faith. And we saw with the Omega exactly where they went. I mean, they went to, we are righteous. You know, we're not going to fail. The movement never fails, right? The movement is going to uh, continue, believing that they are 
the true church. And yet they just had a watered down type of righteousness, which is just being nice. It's something that had completely appealed to the human nature. And that's why the vast majority followed them. But the others who didn't, many of them were still of the same opinion. That is, the same assumptions. They just were conservatives and believed themselves to be righteous as well. So they were really no better. We're really no better than, than those that we condemn. So I'm taking this as, as a symbol, this part of the story, flipping it on its head and saying that this burning of her father and her, and her with fire is representing a work that must happen in the church. It's also connected with Pentecost as well, right? Because Agreed. The, the Holy Spirit rests on their heads as flames of fire. And so we can see here that this, this fire, even this fire that goes into the standing corn of the Philistines. So we, we look at the Philistines as bad. And so we can take all of these symbols and we can see that this represents false teachings. Yet the Philistines in this part of the story, when we get to them burning her and her father with fire, we don't worry about who the Philistines are literally. We just see that this is something that's going to be destroyed and it's being destroyed by the Holy Spirit. And in a sense, there isn't much difference from the fire of Samson in that context and the fire of the Philistines. Both of them are destroying error. So the next part of this story that we're, we're going to look at um, has to do with... Uh, the men of Judah, right? So, so we've addressed this before, but all I can say is that for this first part, we have to put this, this 300 foxes, the Pentecost, in a sense, they're all tied together. But when we address what happens next, this is, this is giving us something else that is it's addressing another point once we, we get into the men of Judah. But even before we get into the men of Judah, we're going to have Samson uh, uh, doing this great slaughter. And so we're going to have to address that as well. And we know that this is going to be um, uh, there's a whole bunch happening here. So what, what happens at Lehi? So um, Yeah, so there's, I, I don't want to jump into it right now. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow. I know we've been going rather slowly, and, and I don't particularly like it, but it's just what happens. Um, because I think that we we really need to to dig into what this means, because this is addressing where we are right now, what it is we have to do. Any final thoughts? We have about five minutes left. I'm glad we're going slowly because my mind tends to race so much and I just get diverted and distracted so easily. So this helps me to slow down and really contemplate on things and learn more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the only thing I want to uh, point out here, I want you to think about before we go to the next study, is we've taken a, a verse in chapter 13 and chapter 14 um, that becomes a, a marker for that verse of what way mark that verse is zoomed into. 
And we had Judges 13, 13 um, for chapter 13 and Judges 14, 14 for chapter 14. But chapter 15, we, we know, is a continuation of chapter 14, this first part of the story, right? But there is an aspect here in this next part, and, and I, I suggest Judges 15.8 is the verse that uh, we, we need to focus on that becomes a major waymark. And why do I choose Judge Judges 15.8? Because of the symbol of 158. Right. So 158 is a symbol. What's the symbol? Of an improper league. Okay. So it's an improper league, right? It's also August 15th. Right? Right. And, and those two symbols really do come together. Those symbols come together in ways that many of us are not yet expecting. Yeah. And I think they come together in this story. So one is we will say it's a symbol of the midnight cry. And, but here we have this great slaughter. We have... Um, you know, the top of, of the rock eat him. We have, he's smiting them hip and thigh. So these are things that we're going to have to look at. So that's what I want you to think about before we come together to study uh, tomorrow morning. I want you to think about that. Okay. Because we still haven't drawn this completely on a line yet. We still have a lot more to do. And we have to decide if we go back and start another line with the rest of Judges 15, that we just take the beginning of Judges 15 as part of Judges 14 and just divide it somewhere else. So, okay, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the study this morning. We ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to work upon our hearts to bring a conviction of our need of you, that we can trust wholly in your righteousness and not our own, and that we can always behold Christ as the standard by which we can never reach, that we have to cling to him, that we have to trust that he can do in us what he did in humanity 2,000 years ago. Be with each person in their personal life, in their prayers, in their study, in their trials. And help us, Lord, to be truly a witness of your character to others. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.